check. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I can oh, you can use that. One. No, I don't know. Okay. 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 So good evening. Um, I have the pleasure tonight of um, introducing Louis Becky uh, from the architectural firm of Henning Larsen Architects in, in uh, Copenhagen. Um, Louis is a, the, a design director and a principal partner at the firm. Um, it is no small firm. It counts uh, 240 employees. Uh, it has offices uh, in numerous cities around the world. Uh, it has looks at realized projects in um, just about 20 countries, also around the world. It was founded, Henning Larsen was founded in 1959, and Henning Larsen started um, very modestly. And um, it's a company that uh, Louise joined in 1989, immediately after having finished his architectural degree at the University uh, of Aarhus. He then became, uh, he joined the management of the company in 1998. It's a management that he uh, shares with one other person today. Uh, he became a partner in 2002, design director in 2005. Uh, he was appointed adjunct professor at the uh, Aalborg University where he studied in 2008. And in 2011, he received the Ekersberg Medal from the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts. Um, locally, we, we will know the, pro, uh, the company from um, the School of Finance here in Frankfurt. Um, also in 2013, the um, Henning Larsen Architects received the um, European Union's Mies van der Rohe Prize uh, for the Harpa Concert Hall in Reykjavik that they did in collaboration with, amongst others, um, um, Studio Ola Eliasson. So the, um, the work shall be well known. Nevertheless, it's also an impressive portfolio that spans from furniture and um, interior fittings, light fittings, to enormous master plans. It's a, um, a portfolio that includes smaller domestic uh, houses, such as uh, the adaptable house from 2013, which um, is a 150 square meter residential structure, to the enormous Busan Opera in South Korea. That was a competition where the company received third prize in 2012. It is also um, a company that spans from um, what would be more um, uh, straightforward, perhaps, office um, complexes. I'm thinking, for instance, of um, the Spiegel headquarters in Hamburg, but also to uh, the Batumi Aquarium in Georgia, a, a, a project that is supposed to be uh, now completed in 2015 where they aggregate sort of a stone-like volumes to house the, uh, the aquarium and its program. It is, in short, a, um, a company with an enormous international profile, with a very impressive portfolio. But I was also, so to speak, touched um, preparing for this introduction and then reading 
about also that uh, it's a company that has a sincere, it expresses so very clearly itself on its internet pages, that it's a company that has a sincere interest in being in contact with students, um, understanding and, and um, developing its own spirit, as it were, um, on the basis of uh, such a contact. And uh, I don't know, Luis, if this is one reason for why we may welcome you here to this small program, but we're very grateful for your interest in coming. So, please, Luis Becky. That was kind words. Thank you so much, Juan. Um, today, I, I plan to take you rather to a kind of broad portfolio overview than, than go in depth with one project. And it means that I will show you six different projects from different places, mostly in, in cultural buildings, uh, and of course uh, with the uh, with the, with the number of projects we're doing, this is, I wouldn't say a fragment, this is something we really uh, celebrate as, as important. But first I would like to introduce you to, let's say, the, the base philosophy of, uh, of the office. For us, architecture is very much about people or stating human interaction. and means that we see architecture as a framing uh, around activity and not by itself as let's say, with qualities, whatever it could be, that without people in, in, in our projects, it seems to be a little bit, uh, well, flat in, in, in its context. So people becomes the center point for our design. This is the National Opera in Copenhagen. Um, that's the foyer space. That's so important because that's, that's where people interact when they get out from the auditorium, from the formal part of, of the show. And we call that kind of space the theater in the theater, or the, the different theater. We work with spaces. You do that in your studies. Uh, we do this in, 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 our, in our practice. Uh, but, but also spaces that will be formed by, uh, by daylight. And formed by daylight is, is very important for us, because coming out of a Scandinavian context, Daylight is a scarce resource and it's something you focus on all the way through the projects. So for my started in, in 89 and even in my studies, it was something that was really looked upon how will daylight inform the spaces, what will happen in a, in a very dark winter day in contrast to a very light and very long uh, summer day, uh, let's say in Copenhagen and somewhere in the Nordic countries. Just looking at that map, you can see where the most solar gain will be. It's also a map you use to, to identify where's the best places to put up uh, photovoltaics. Do you know that if you put like five spots of a size of this, you would cover the entire energy consumption on the planet if you did it around the equator. That means that it's interesting, and I'm not going to talk about that today, but it means that countries like Somalia, uh, the poorest places in the world, can be the richest places in a new energy uh, policy and, and invention uh, later on. We've been working with that in Oman uh, and also in Saudi Arabia, uh, quite a few, in a few projects. But coming back to the quality of daylight, the pictures you see to the, uh, to the left, that's from the uh, big library in, in Malmö in Sweden, and it just talks about how a summer day totally colors the space in a different way than a winter day. And that atmospheric approach to architecture is something we work with and test out a lot in our, in our design. But also the, the warm southern light coming, coming down, washing the walls to the cold northern light uh, in the roof. But Johan, we, we exceeded the 240 last, uh, yesterday we were 300. Um, and it's a bit difficult to control because we have offices uh, in different places, uh, six offices uh, at the moment and, and they're growing. And we don't have any ambition of being very big or having a lot of offices. What's changed a lot and it's happened the last 10 years is that when you do these big projects, the client wants to have you close by, you want to see a co-creative 
process and it means that you have to set up a local presence somehow. And it's not to conquer the world, it's really to be able to work architecturally with the projects. And I'll show you a project here from Frankfurt in a minute and, and maybe also that will show you what happens when you're not too close by uh, your, uh, your client. We have four majors we work with. We, it's right, we do projects like the adaptable house, 150 square meters. But basically when we are out of Scandinavia, we work with four majors. And planning on urban design is, is of course, extremely important. You build cities with, the, with that knowledge. And that, the, the picture to the, to the uh, left is from the, um, the city of, of, of Bergen, uh, where we do a, a small uh, city intervention, uh, 40,000 square meters in, in the city center. The other one, that's from Saudi Arabia, where we've done a plan of 3.3 million square meters that is under construction right now. We have a site with 31,000 workers uh, and a budget of 10 billion US dollars in total construction value. And, and in that one, we of course not architects for all the buildings, that's 140 buildings. Uh, we invited architects from all over the world to participate and do that. But when we do this planning, we are really trying to understand local culture, the climate, the behavior, so we don't come like white elephants and set up something that can never work uh, when we are, we are not uh, at the place anymore. But that project started uh, with an interview in London. Uh, I don't know why they chose us. We had no experience at all. Uh, but that was a magic moment. Uh, to f uh, six weeks later be in the desert. Uh, there was nothing but sand. And a client, uh, I, I talked to the client, and the client said, you know, uh, you have a contract, here's the land. And I said, where's the brief? There's no brief. We want a financial district. Do it. And it took uh, two and a half years just to write the brief, because we had to call in experts from all over the world to find out well, how we do this. This is for 70,000 people. It's, uh, it's 50,000 parking spaces. It's a train system. It's a district cooling system. It's how buildings react to extreme heat. Uh, it is how you shade public space and stuff like that. Uh, so, so we learned a lot and we are just uh, in our ninth year of the project now. And we hope to finalize in 2017 with all the projects. We do learning spaces. And learning spaces because they build they build uh, societies, they build simply what, what you're doing here, but they build knowledge in, in different countries. This is the one to the, to the left, it's from uh, Plymouth. It's the art and architecture faculty of, of Plymouth University. And the other one is the, uh, the business school here in Frankfurt. It's the first picture or the first image we did uh, also for the competition. But this is so important to, uh, uh, to work in this field because that's where that's where most in, um, innovation happens, not just, uh, uh, let's say, uh, technically, but also architecturally, I think, at the moment. And we moved that into workspaces or headquarters, basically. That's from the far left, is from, from uh, uh, Spiegel in, in, in Hamburg, and the other one is from a city hall in Copenhagen, or in, in, in Denmark, Viborg. And, and what's, in, what's interesting with these large organizations is that, in a way, if you really look into them, they have the same aspirations, they have the same goals as a school or a university would have. They want to enhance how you grow knowledge, they want to see people work together, they want to see results coming out. And when we were in the first competition for that, and that is the, the Spiegel in the corner, we had no knowledge about it, so we invented this idea, maybe we just do this headquarter as a university and we won the competition because everybody else did a mo much more commercial building. And now we have done a, quite a few of these buildings, but they all reflect, let's say, the, the ideas back into the educational uh, sector. And then we do cultural projects, and cultural projects because they are the ones that really build identities for cities, for regions, and for countries. And uh, that's the opera um, to, the, to the left, and that is uh, in Uppsala, uh, a concert hall. Interesting about the cultural project is that they need to 
represent the, let's say, the common spirit or something that keeps us together in the different places. And it is a challenge to do that in very different cultures and different countries. <clears throat> we work with sustainability uh, as, a, as a major uh, component of our design from the very first sketch we have it in. We have 16 full-time researchers working on sustainability and now we're not talking about science science, we're talking about applied science, something we use on an everyday basis. We focus on energy and daylight because daylight is what gives atmosphere and, and well-being and, and, and something to people. But on the other hand, it also provides a lot of energy in, in buildings. So that's the two majors we work with. We also do wind and acoustics. Uh, but it's, it's all things you would experience if you enter a building or enter an open space. At the moment, we are the ones doing, I would say, 90% of all uh, daylight uh, measures in, in the Danish construction industry, and we do it for a lot of the big engineering companies, because they, they, are, they do it so generic that you can't use it. Uh, and we do it uh, differently. So we also work with the government and, and set in uh, and, and do the, the, the building codes for uh, in nas national for, for Denmark. Just to be very much a practitioner here, um, this is a slide I, I, I used for a um, uh, for a developer in, in, in Amsterdam, and the developer wanted uh, approximately 14,000 square meters of. Of, uh, of a building for a certain number of, of workspaces. And we could show them if you raise the floor to ceiling height, and it means that you can have permanent workspace, and not as where you have the red dot, that's where you can't work, because it's less than 3% daylight. There, there's a rule in Scandinavia, and it's, it's coming to Europe very soon, that you have to have at least 3% daylight on your workspace at, and two percent of the daylight at any time outside, so it differs over the day and over the year. And if you can't provide that, you can only have archives or toilets or stuff like that. So if you look at it from a very, let's say, investment perspective, we could show that by raising the floor to ceiling height, we could build less square meters with the same number of workspaces. That made an impression on this guy. I can tell you that. Um, we, I would say that 95 to 99 percent of our buildings, they have an energy code which is less than 40 kilowatts per square meter per year. And that's because that is a rule if you want a building, building permit in Scandinavia. And we just took that and exported that to all our different uh, offices around the world. I, must say though that in Saudi it's a little more difficult to get to 40 kilowatts per square meter. We are around 110, 120 in, in that country. But if you take US, US would be 250 to 350 kilowatts per square meter per year in a normal building. So that's a, a low one. And I, what I wanted to demonstrate with this is that if you want to reduce your consumption for use, you have to do that effectively. It happens to be Thermal mass, it happens in the configuration of spaces, it happens in the facade. Above the 40 kilowatts per square meter, if you want to save more, you have to implement systems, you have to implement technology. And what we see in many, many projects is that, yes, you can have a very ambitious dean in a university or a CEO of a company. The problem is that there's nobody to run these systems afterwards you have to have a highly sophisticated educational background, engineering background, to run the systems. And many, in many places, you don't have that. The guy who's in charge of the building, he's entering the bins and brooming, and at the same time, he's running these systems. So that's, that's the problem. To, to do design in, in six different places uh, around the world and trying to, I wouldn't say control it, because you shouldn't control it, you should inspire and, and discuss it. We, we have, we've done this, this very simple um, uh, method, and it, it's, it's a method we also have been teaching in some, some uh, architecture school with, and it, it goes quite simple from da data collection, and you know everything about this, but data collection, do we have the right, right data, what, and we conclude about that, do an uh, analytic approach, which means our exercise, what is 
what is coming out of the data. And what we do then, and I think maybe that is the only thing that will give us a bit, is saying that we establish a strategic concept. And that's the why behind the projects. What should this project solve in reality? Artistically, technically, financially, uh, the aspirations from the client, what about the city? So instead of just trying to design your way through it, we try to set up the, the scoreboard for the building. And, and it's, not, it's not preventing any, uh, let's say, artistic approach to what you do, it, it rather supports it. And after we did that method, and we do this a lot in competitions, our hit rate have improved dramatically in, 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 uh, in, in when we participate. Because we, in a way, we know what we are doing, and we, we focus our energy uh, in that area. And then we develop typically two architectural concepts as an answer or, a, 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 let's say, a reaction to the strategic concept, and we test which of them that really works, and that one will be developed to, uh, with the production and the communication, and in the end, as a as a competition entry or as a sketch proposal to a to a client. We do these uh, summer schools. Uh, I don't know why this. I think it comes from Henning Larsen himself. But I, it's always been. We've been always quite interested in what's happening in different schools, and uh, in 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 that uh, workshop we did in in a Christian church in Beirut. We had Bartlett from London. We had the Royal Academy in Copenhagen. We had maybe we had also TU Berlin. Or oh, was there another one? I can't remember that. And then we had the local AUB from, from, from Beirut. And it's interesting to see what happens when you merge so different cultures. We learned in Beirut that there's people in that city that have lived there all their lives that have never been to different parts of the city because there's a different religious uh, situation. They cannot, they cannot go there. And it was like an eye-opener in a way to see how privileged we are and how easy we, we come about. But, but the whole uh, understanding of the uh, conditions you do architecture under uh, will be well, enlightened a lot for, for all of us. And in, 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 in Beirut, we worked with dreams of Beirut, what would happen if you didn't have this situation with the Christians, with the Muslims that are fighting all the time? Uh, what would happen in, in an urban scale with the public space? How would that uh, develop? Jumping to the projects. And I just start with Frankfurt because it's not, it's, it's not a, uh, we don't know yet, we have a groundbreaking ceremony the 24th of this month. Um, it's a huge project um, and it's a competition we, we won in 2013. I think we've been detailing uh, as much as we could. Now it's been taken over by, by a local architect here in, in, in Frankfurt. And, and that, seems to be happening when you work in Germany. But our idea with this project was to, to find a way to, to, to create a school that, that, let's say, hold the qualities of the city and, and at the same time uh, provided an educational environment that would be um, supporting the, of course, development of knowledge, but also the interaction between students uh, and the, let's say, the senior academia of, of the school. This is something we do, and I, I, this has been taken from our, from our strategic concepts it's, it, or from our data collections to understand where we are. We are in Frankfurt, you know that. We are in, in the Ring Road, uh, in the outskirts, you would know that, where that is. And then we look at, at some really just raw and, 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 and standard data of, of the city, but it talks about certain things. It talks about size of city. It talks about how old the city would be, and that means do we have a historical background. And it also talks about the percentage or number of students in a city, because that really, really changes the whole way a city works, the number of students. I would say that you can say that in, in, see that in, in any city you visit, if you have close to like 30 or 40 percent students, it's a completely different place than 10 or 9, as you have here in, in, in Frankfurt. And then we look at the, at the uh, hours of daylight uh, and night and how it differs from summer to winter. And you can see here it's, it's almost uh, double up in the summer, which of course is quite similar to, uh, to Denmark. We have a little more daylight than you have, but not much. In this project, we, we remember we walked, we walked the, the sile, 
or desire in in, uh, in in the city center, and, and this very let's say huge pedestrian street, and it was very nice and gave an impression of a of a of a, of a friendly city, of a place where people would like to be, and we we wanted to take that atmosphere or that understanding of public space into our building. We also wanted to to take that profile the Americans provided when they established the, um, the bank after the Second World War uh, up to the, uh, to the school. So we want to take the DNA of the city and bring it out to the outskirts because that, that plot is really on the outskirts of what's been seen as the, um, of the city of, of, of Frankfurt. This is a picture or a render that is quite <clears throat> late in the process. Um, we wanted to have the, the towers. It's a 400 square meter unit that comes up. And the reason why it's that is that they teach like that. And they also rent out the school function as a business school. It's a very high end business school in the European context. Uh, and they also have uh, programs where they have companies renting a couple of floors or some square meters to do strategies together with the uh, research people. And it means that. that that renting out these these uh, uh, square meters is a part of the of the business model, and so you have to create some something that is this the particular and, and separated from the school. It's all centered around a big street, and the, the street runs runs all the way through here. So there's a new student accommodation area, student housing in this area. You walk in here. This is the main entrance. This is the listed part of the old building. Uh, and you, you can walk to, to, to different, we have the canteen in this area. So this main street is a very simple um, version of, of, an, uh, of, a, of a central space uh, to the school. We had a limited budget. We have had 1,936 euros per square meter. And in the strategic concept, we had tested what does that mean in the Frankfurt and Hessen in the Frankfurt area. And it means no cantilevered stuff, no fun, cheap facades. Um, everything, you had to be really, really needy greedy about anything if you want that budget to work. And we knew that they would not put more money into this project, so we had to fulfill the program. We took a decision in the competition to go for spaces and not for, let's say, quality of facade. So it's, it's a low budget facade on that building. In the final, we were up against Dominique Perrault. He did a beautiful facade, but no spaces, or very fewer spaces. And I think we were right in this strategic approach that it was the spaces that would win. It's just to show you these units, you will see coming again. Oh, sorry. Oh, go back up here, which is the ones that are connected. Uh, where we can have the separate uh, companies or separate departments working. The, the big street happens down here, and above that, the tower springs up. And one of the things that I'm a little bit sad about is that it ended up being a total even uh, kind of machine. Uh, in the end, you had to maximize the square meters towards the city plan. And there's so many regulations in, Ham in, 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 uh, in uh, Frankfurt, so you couldn't do uh, what we wanted to do. But inside, inside we have these, this quite generous uh, space opening up. Uh, we have an idea that you can come as a, as a young student and you in kind of one position can see the whole school in a way as an invitation that invites you to participate in different things, in, in different classes, and you don't have to knock on a closed door to get in there. From the VIP program, which is the top floor, you're looking down into the to the main street, which is the style, like equivalent to the side in, in the city. You look and look back into the business district. Of course, these students, they want to be bankers, they want to be investment people. So in a way, we just show them this is where you're going afterwards. And then from the outside, we try. We tried very hard to keep the feel of the of the tower structure, not just one big block. It's almost 200 meters long. It's really, really big. 
um, so so it's important to to scale it down. If you look in that neighborhood, all the buildings are at a, at a scale, the biggest one at a scale like like this, not bigger. Uh, and there was also been a been a fight, and the interns coming in, and then keeping this listed uh, building or bi part of the old building in front as a, a meeting center uh, in the in the parkscape. So, if you pass by the 24th of June, you will see the groundbreaking ceremony there. We already tear down the, the old building. A completely different and a completely different scale also, much smaller. It's this university campus in Umeå. This is, um, this is a place, I'm going to come to that now, which is very north, much northern than, than, than Oslo and, and Copenhagen. It's all, way, all up here. And they say they, they want to have the title as the most northern architecture school in the world. And the dean says that the students only study a very short while in spring and a short while in, in, uh, in fall, because in winter they sleep and in summer they party. So, so that's very difficult condition to teach in, but they try to do their best uh, to do that. It's a, it's a private tycoon that gave the money to this university. He wanted to give something back to the city where he grew up, he makes business in all over Sweden, and we won that competition. Um, I don't know why we won it, but but at least we won it. I think because we we were up against big in, in that, and we were we were scaling it to the city. We used the timber. It's a place where you float timber down the river, so you see these uh, things that we we, we wanted to use a kind of a local technique and 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 te uh, tectonics in the in the building. If you look at that place. You have almost 50% students in the city. It's a very active school. They have a, a very nice program with animation, which is that's also an art school, and, and they have a, they're very big in that. And it's one of the most international schools in Sweden. I don't know how you survive if you come from Spain or something and you sit there in the darkness, because in the winter there's only four hours of, of, of daylight. And if you have, a let's say, an overclouded day with the four hours, you have basically no sunlight. Nothing at all. It seems totally dark. I've been there one winter day. It was horrible. But again, in the summer, you have these uh, you have these uh, um, uh, 20 hours of, of daylight instead. But the whole city is so much influenced, or town influenced by the students, that it really lives up or gives a, a, a completely different atmosphere uh, to the place. It's a small campus here. We have the art faculty over here. We have our exhibition. Uh, our art exhibition center here. We have the architecture school in, in this one. This is only three and a half thousand square meters, so it's a it's a small building. You see the campus close on. We wanted to we wanted to have spaces that also works where you have the snow kind of coming in and the and and the winds from Siberia and from the North Pole. Uh, so it had to be kind of dense, and it, it had to be creating, let's say, creating smaller places. There's a there's a staircase taking you down to the uh, to the river here. And in the front, we we worked with uh, with some platforms. Uh, there, some of that have been installed, and uh, not all. And then this is a situation you can see. It's a rather, let's say, normal Swedish city. Um, I don't know if you know Sweden a lot, but a lot of the cities in Sweden, they were totally destroyed in the 60s because they were so wealthy compared to the Norwegians and the Danes. Uh, so in Sweden you had a called the Million Apartment Program, and in a lot of the provincial cities, they totally teared out the center of the city, replaced it with uh, poor, poor quality 60s buildings, and today a lot of the places suffers, suffers a lot from that, and in this one it's, it's, it's almost, a, oh, it's, it is the same situation. So we work with the, with the, with the wood as, as a signal to the outside. It is a, a concrete structure, uh, and that is the, uh, the exhibition uh, hall. We, we have the uh, very 
let's say, visual contact to the, to the river. The river is kind of the drive of, of anything in, in, in that place. So from, the, from, from these spaces, you look out, we have concrete floors, white walls. It have, it's about the art, not about uh, the building, but it's, it's very much about the, the light. And just from the exhibition on the, on the inside, as, as such. Oh, sorry, where's the sketches? Oh, sorry. I think they must be blinded, but we have some skit. There's, there's an idea when you, when you enter the building, you come up here, we have these places where you look out. We don't want to have an exhibition area where you don't have contact to your context. You have to somehow understand where you are. I'll show another museum later on, we have the same situation. You cannot make these black boxes. It's crazy. You have to, 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 to see it. And I think when you do museums, that kind of turns the whole thing inside. It becomes... Um, claustrophobic uh, to be there. I'm sorry about the sections, they did not show up. This is the architecture school. And in that school, we tested for the first time the 3% daylight, because the rule until now had been 2% daylight at any uh, time on workspace uh, all year round. In this place, we have 3% daylight. So we had to work a lot with the facade to provide that. And it looks very random, it is not. There's a, there's a clear definition of how many percent of glass we have in each level of, of the space. It's an extremely uh, simple and, uh, let's say, um, well, quite a simple organized plan with, uh, with workspaces and, and departments out here. It's all open, centered around uh, around this centerpiece where we have uh, some um, uh, auditoriums, we have the staircases, and, and the idea is that it's totally open, there's no walls. Any class can be accessed by another student without knocking at any door because they don't have any doors. We have these uh, four floors. Uh, the last floor takes you down to the level of, of, of the river here, and we have, we're working with the roof light inside. It's approximately a 30 by 30 square meter uh, plan. You, you see this system here. We have the the, uh, the the least openings to the floor, most in the center, and a little more at the top. And you need to have the light being thrown deep into the building to provide the uh, the daylight. And this represents a three percent daylight at the architecture school uh, on the inside. And of course, it's always also been helped by the roof lights that kind of sends uh, uh, the, 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 the light down the, the, um, in the white walls. The wooden facades on the inside, <coughs> they are used for, for pin-ups. You can really easily put them on the floor, but they are also, for acoustical reason, it's, it sticks uh, with an acoustical uh, uh, textile uh, behind and it gives a, a, a soft atmosphere and the students can make a lot of noise without being totally, uh, it feels totally crazy. We use the, the staircase as uh, also an, an, um, a kind of an auditorium here, it doesn't go like that, but we try to, to, to reuse all spaces more than one time because we didn't have that much money to do it, it was a private donation, we had to be careful about the money, so in a way we we, we thought this as, as, as more than just, just a staircase. But the transparency, and this is where we are quite happy about it, is that it's all this idea that you from any point can see that somebody's doing something in the building. And I think especially in this project, in this place in the world, it's so important that students connect socially because there's nowhere to go, unless with the other students, you have to be within there. There's, you cannot go in Paris, you could go to another part, to a fancy nightclub or meet some other people. There's nobody to meet here. You have to be with your fellow students. Just give you on the inside. Um, it's nice, the school is nice because it's quite messy. And I know you, yours, I'm sure you also have it like that. Um, and, and the spaces can, can kind of take it. We have a, um, a clear height of three meters from from floor to to up here, so so again it it, it feels open and and uh, and uh, and okay to just f have all this stuff hanging around. A completely different project. Um, 
It's a faculty of economics. It's the first sustainable faculty being done in Denmark. We got extra money from the government to, to test different options here. Um, it's, uh, it's ambitious in spaces, ambitious in energy consumption and daylight. That was like major ones. It's a provincial city of Kolding, and now it, it, it's, it's, it's really on the, I wouldn't say countryside, but it's far from Copenhagen. It's a city that needs to be revitalized. They have a, a quite a good design school, but that's the only thing really happening in, in the city. And um, it's, it's placed uh, quite close to, uh, to the harbor, and in one of these uh, plots that's been used for harbor activities before. And then there's a big kind of green area uh, around it here. You see the, the plot here? It's a triangular building and the reason why we made it triangular is because because that is a very energy efficient thing. The most eff energy efficient is a round building but that's more expensive to build so we thought maybe not use all the money for that because when you, when, you, when you curve it, it just no matter how many computers we have in the office, when you're on the construction site, it just becomes more expensive. We know it from the tender process, so in a way you have to be careful when you do that. And we rather want to use the money for, for the spaces. So we have a triangular building, it reacts to the, to the, to the, uh, to the site and creates a, a, um, a different, uh, let's say, uh, outdoor landscape here. We have the, uh, our, uh, the design school in, in, in this area here, so there's a close connection. Yes, but then there's not a close connection in the content, what they research in. Let's see what happens over the years. We just open this faculty. We have this triangular uh, form. It's a, we have an, an, an atrium that, re, that moves like that, revolves up um, to, uh, to create different balconies and spaces as, as you walk up. We placed all the common facilities here and we have all the formal facilities to the facade. That means that, that you, when you come in, it's a very open and, and inviting in environment. You walk towards the daylight from, from, the, from the ground floor, up the stairs, up the stairs, and you have this huge uh, roof light. It's, it's much bigger in the other direction uh, that, that floats this, this space. And the idea is that that you, you come in and you look up, you see students on different balconies, they're working, and you make your way up and you pass people and there's a social interaction. And it also provides these informal learning spaces. In, and we've done a very huge number of universities, it seems to be there's a, a certain r recipe for learning in, in, a, in a traditional university at least, maybe not architecture school, but but more in this kind of, of faculty. And that is like you have a, a, a formal lecture, I'm talking today to you, then you have an informal part which is about discussing and digesting what happened, and then you, you, you let's say by that, be able to, uh, to present your own knowledge in a way. So this is these three steps of learning in a way. And all these buildings we do, they always have or cater for these situations. And the most important one is to get money to provide square meters for the informal learning, where, where you interact, where you don't have a formal teaching situation, but you work in groups, you work with somebody. It's very difficult in the programs to get money or to or get in the brief to get square meters allocated to that. So we cheat, we do fraud, we do all kinds of things to to, to take square meters from from something and push them out into these spaces. And this, oh sorry, oh, this is a, an, a, an example of that. You come up the stairs, we have this quite big area with different kind of, of situations. In the process when we work with the, uh, with the faculty, they understand it and it goes, but in the competitions, it's really difficult. So you see we have places here, places here, places here for students to, to work and also uh, sitting here. So from, we want to be able to have people working individually, but also in the, in the, uh, in the group, sorry. Just around. That's the formal auditorium, looks like anything else on these uh, types. 
and then then here we have the um, we have the uh, uh, the materials or the the atmosphere being being done. It's very Nordic with these uh, white white walls and grey floors, and then the the the, the few coloured uh, items uh, being put in, and that's the fabric and the uh, the wooden sticks uh, with the with the textile behind on the uh, lift core, and then. Then you see people sitting in different uh, settings. The idea is that you are you sit with your group and work, but you're still a part of 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 a, of a bigger community. So we want to create a community within the faculty, and it's okay to be separated in, in a small group, but you're always part of 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 the bigger story. We have though a few places where you can withdraw into a um, a glass. Uh, meeting facility if you really need to sit alone or you need to have a meeting that that cannot be held outside and you can draw the curtains for that otherwise you sit along the facade uh, alone or you can use these outdoor balconies uh, to sit uh, smoking is still quite popular in Denmark uh, and uh, a lot of the smokers sit here but we we can see now that the students use this for, for work and we have even seen classes happening uh, out there the roof light, it's one meter and twenty deep from, from ceiling. That's because we don't want to see glare in the in the uh, in the screens uh, or, or something messing up in the in the uh, in the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the in, in the in the center part of the, of the building. It's a it is a stretch cloth we use. That's why it gets so even if you do this in uh, if you do this in, in gypsumite you will be able to see all the screws and holes and sparkling and, and stuff. You cannot do that with, with light coming, like washing down, uh, and especially not sunlight. So it's, it's, it's a different system. On the outside, we have uh, louvers that can uh, open and, and close, and they are being controlled by a, a sensor on the roof. It means that the building follows the sun, and it closes. As soon as the sun hits the facade, they close down and they open up again when the sun disappears. So the whole faculty is kind of alive over a day uh, as the sun travels uh, around it. And this is perforated uh, aluminum seats. It, we, were, we were running out of money even though we didn't have, uh, we had a better budget than normally, so we had to do that. This is an evening situation where we always steer the whole thing and opens up, and you can see some of the, of the outdoor areas being represented here. Personally, I'm not, I'm not too fond with that one when we opened up. We were, we were weak for a minute and thought that it was not exciting enough, the building, you know. That's a bad thing. Just be a little bit boring in architecture, so that's good, because it lasts a long time. <laughs> it's not a fashion thing. This is a, a project in Africa. This is the west coast of Africa, Nigeria. It's the southern part, <coughs> quite a Christian part, more peaceful than, than up north. Um, it's a competition we won uh, three years ago. Um, it was a competition held, the presentation was held in the airport here in Frankfurt. Uh, the governor of Calabar State came here and, uh, and we were uh, have asked to, to, to do a design. And the story in short is that, that I got a mail from, from Nigeria. Have you get, got mail from Nigeria where they said, sir, something, then you delete because you think your computer will be you know, totally ruined. Uh, and so I did that. And then two weeks later, there was a new mail, and I was like, just about to do it. And I was like, sir, didn't you read my last mail? I was like, I better, I better read this one. And it said that they sent a mail, and they want to invite us for a competition in Nigeria. And, and Denmark and Nigeria is very far away. It's like so much apart that you would not see it. Um, and I, I wrote a very polite mail back that we didn't have capacity and we were fully, fully occupied. And then there was a new mail from this guy saying, would it help on your capacity issue if I sent you 20,000 US dollars? And I wrote back, everything helps if somebody sends us 20,000 US dollars. So they did that. And I forgot anything about it. And then three weeks later, our bookkeeper the, uh, the accountant came and said, who, who received 20,000 US dollars? There's no, we cannot, there's no attachment to it. And I was like, oh, I think it's me. 
Then they came to Copenhagen, we met them in the airport, and they were extremely ambitious, these guys, and they were so well organized. And, and we were really taken by the ambition of the country. And at some point I, um, I had to ask this guy, it was a question that was just been in my head all the time, we, we, had, we hadn't started the competition yet, and, and I asked him, but how, how did you find us? You know, how did Nigeria find Copenhagen somehow? And then he said, well, of course, we looked at the internet, and um, honestly, we need some more Nordic thinking in Africa. I was like, wow, that was something. So we really put a lot of, of effort into it, and we, and we studied the, the place. It's, you see, the, it's near, it, it's, it's in the southern part, you can see it down here. In the, in the, in the corner, we have a big uh, the river delta coming up, and this is the Calabar uh, state. The city of Calabar in the river, uh, Cross River State is the place, and this is called Calabar. It's a place where they have an extremely enlarged carnival. Uh, I would say it's even bigger than, than Rio de Janeiro, uh, and, and very nice. Uh, but they also have a, a population where 50% of, of the people there are under 14 years old. So it's a very young country, in a way, and, 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 it, and it, it sets a completely different tone than we, uh, than we know in, in, in Northern Europe. They have a uh, almost same length of day all year round. They have a pleasant climate, unless it rains a lot. In a couple of months, it rains one and a half meter per month. So that is a lot. Uh, so that's why we have the rainforest here. And we had to, to bring that into the design. What we also wanted to do with this design was to make a building that could technically be built by people locally because we wanted to create work and not just come with an uh, advanced German or Danish or UK machine that could be implemented by, uh, by craftsmen from, from our part of the world. We wanted to create a kind of a, a simple structure but, but powerful in its, in, its, in, its, uh, in its design, sorry. So we did this kind of rocky thing uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the riverbed um, as, as an idea. We worked with, with, uh, with a big uh, foyer space, opening up, see the whole horizon, because we are lifted above the jungle, uh, and we have the, the back of house facilities here. We have an indoor, indoor foyer space, but we also have an outdoor foyer space. And the outdoor foyer space is covered because that's where you can be when it rains heavily uh, down. We have a 3,500-seater uh, auditorium here. We have exhibition places. We have a restaurant area in this, uh, in, in this uh, place. And we have a, a backstage area where we can have 15,000 people for one show. And this is the big show for the carnival. Section-wise, it, it opens up in the bottom. We have the, the, the venue behind. Uh, just two different sections, and it's quite steep as it goes down to the uh, to the river. But this is the view we imagine uh, would happen uh, in the place, and some of the spaces when you come into almost a cave um, uh, beh be between the big rocks or in the, the in between space of of the rocks. What happened then is that when we won the competition and and uh, and and they started uh, working on it. They locally got very ambitious, and now it's the most cantilevered structure in West Africa ever built. But that was certainly not our idea. We tried to to talk them out of it, but they wouldn't hear because they they have an ambition of also showing that Africa can do this. So so now it is a it's a it's a, a casted structure that is have no columns underneath, which was not the design idea. But of course, in a way, you cannot say to people, be less ambitious because we want to see you as a third world thing and you should not be so advanced and stuff. It doesn't work like that. You, you have to follow what, what's up there. So that's the, that's the plot, how it looks when we, when we started. We had to clear the, the jungle with a, with a big uh, machine. So virtually we were out there and they, they drove, drove and said, is it here? Yeah, let's say, can we go a little more to that side? Yes, we test here. So that's the way you do it. We didn't do it from a satellite or anything like that. It was really hands-on. And then this huge machinery with all the casting started and they brought in brick from, from, from France 
to, to help them out to, to do this. Uh, and this is during construction. Uh, very much have been, been done there. We've just been on a, let's say, a three months basis going to meetings and, and clarifications. It's a local firm that have taken the construction side. And suddenly it, it happened that it was flying over the, the river. Um, and these pictures, they are only a few days old. They are from, uh, from Monday, um, which I'm a little bit surprised. Honestly, these should be in different colors, but uh, it seems that they've done something differently. And, and they have cleared it up, and I can't really see how they've done that because that was not a part of the design. This is what happens in a distance. You know, you, when you design something and you're not close by, it, it, it takes a different direction. It's, it's something about, it's not evil people that don't want to do what you did. They interpret, it, they interpret what you do, but they also have ambition in themselves and, and it moves to somewhere. And you can either accept it or you can do this very, you know, controlling, controlling, controlling thing. And in this instance, we, we could not do it because we, then we had to have people full time in, in Nigeria to be there. I saw these pictures from the stairs, that was quite okay that it looks like that. And then, a strange thing, we had the, the, the cladding from outside should walk, come all the way into the inner foyer space, and it, it, it's a different ceiling system. But that's also a part of it. I'm looking forward to the, to the opening and to see how many new details will be presented for uh, at that time. But the thing is that, I just want to say that, Africa is really interesting. It's interesting because people are ambitious, they are ambitious on a personal level, but they're even more ambitious on a national level with the different countries. And, it, and there's a lot of things happening, there's a lot of energy, the good people uh, on the move in, in Africa at the moment. Hopefully it will not be spoiled too much by investments from, from this part of the world. And this is the vision we did, and that's why I'm, I just wanted to repeat the colors we thought would happen, and it's the colors of the, of the country. Another museum just opened, um, this, I have this pretty another one left. This opened uh, in September, October in, uh, in Denmark. It is a, a museum for archaeological uh, findings. It's about the past and history of, of, of Denmark. It's situated in the provincial city of, of Aarhus, which is, which is here, Copenhagen is over here. And it's, the city center is, is in here and it, it, it's out in, in this kind of greenfield area. We took in the competition a very simple approach, said, okay, if we just see the project as, as something that opens up to the underground, to the past, to the history of Denmark, and then you walk down, that's the only take we do. And, I don't know, we want it at least, and uh, now it's built. Aarhus is much more a, a educational city, I was educated or, or trained there. Uh, it's a very nice place. Um, there's a very close collaboration between this museum and the university, and the reason why the museum is there at all comes from the university. It was a uh, very ambitious uh, guy or, or researcher or professor from, from Copenhagen that couldn't, couldn't give leverage to what he wanted to do. He moved to Aarhus, and he managed to start up a museum uh, in the 50s. In this place, we have Danish daylight situation, which means that we have, it, it, it changes also, but not as, as, as crazy as in, in Umeå in, in, in Sweden. Oh, sorry. This is our, our main client. He's, uh, he's from uh, 290 years before Christ was born, and so he's an old guy, uh, but he's the main attraction. And he's the reason why the museum in the first instance was made, and people are really coming to see that. He had a, a very sad uh, end of life. His throat was cut, uh, and he had a, a really a, a bruise in his, his, his head, back of head. I think they killed him. Maybe they punished him first, and then they, they cut up the throat. But he was preserved but he, because he was in a, what do you call it, black water, mosa? I don't know what's called in English. You know, these places with that, with these almost rotten water, it was found there. So, existing museum down here, we created this new one on, on, top, of the, on top of the hill. In these projects, and also go for the African one, but it's very obvious there, 
we we are we are looking to do something for people that can't or will not buy a ticket. I think it's really important for the college institutions that they provide something to the surrounding urban realm or, or whatever they are that that gives access. So in this project, we we in, this is from the competition. We did a running track uh, across the roof and and a route so you can run down again and out and. Today it's actually used, but I think you cannot only, when you do these things, ask for people to pay 50 or 100 euros to get in there and think that it's okay. You have to, you have to do more than that. You have to be generous somehow. If you don't do that, you end up doing a fortress, a cultural fortress, and that's the worst thing you can do. So the sledging roof coming down, we have the floor, so we have the main exhibition down here, so you enter at, at, at this level, you can go up to a, to a small exhibition, there's a, a contemporary exhibition happening in, at this floor, and then you can, from the outside, walk all the way up to the roof uh, here. So you enter, you enter via bridge, also to change the atmosphere to the ticketing area. You have a big kind of flat floor here, you have a temporary exhibition here, we have these breakout rooms, and that was a huge fight with these museum people, that we want people to be able to walk out and take a, a breath of fresh air, or like mentally like say, okay, I'm in this exhibition, but I'm also, I'm also in this place where they found the stuff. You know, it's not just, this is the place where it happened. So it's interesting to be, be outside. We have a cafe and all this, and this is the back of house support to the, uh, to the museum. And then you walk down, to a huge exhibition that is basically a black box. And all exhibition people, they want black boxes. And they don't want tilting uh, walls or anything like that. They don't want like the Maxi Museum in, in, uh, in Rome by Sahadid. They want something they can control, which I think is okay. But we put in these qualities again to be able to look out. Looking from a distance at it, in the bridge where you, where you walk, uh, across to, to enter the space, very much daylighted contact to the outside using uh, Swedish sl slate, uh, wooden sticks uh, on, 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 on top. Again, very flexible uh, ceiling system. We can take some out, put, put light in and stuff like that. And then the big staircase, which is the main attraction to go down to the exhibition or up to the other exhibition here. We used it as an as exhibition place as well with, uh, with people of the size and expression as they had, uh, of course, many, many years ago. It's a bit, it's a bit frightening. They really, really feel, you feel that they're alive and, and they're like, they like that. And they, they are fully proportioned like us. They're just so small. It's strange. Inside the exhibition, black box, they have a, they talk about the, the, this very the traumatic war for Danes where the Germans cut a good bite of, of the southern part of Denmark, took it away and we, we never really came back on that. Um, so that is a, a big thing. Um, from the top of the roof, this is where you can, you can sit with the family, you can, you can go there without the ticket. And it, it had become a destination. I would say almost more for the roof than for the exhibition, at least for if you look at a, at a broader scale of, of, uh, of people. We use these, these rather brutalistic concrete walls or slabs around it to, to emphasize the, um, the, the gravity here. We, we, we in, in, at some part and at some point in our design, we had a much more slim kind of uh, or, or elegant way, and in a way, uh, elegant kind of, of lit, uh, we lost a little bit of the, uh, of the robustness of the place. So we came back to this again, and it was a balance. And I, I, I still think when I go there that it, it works, it, it sends this signal of this is a, it's a used construction. We, we, have an, we have an idea that we as, as architects, we know what will happen in our spaces. We design for that. But if, if you ever tested, if you ever done a design of a building, and it's a public building, and you go to Instagram, you will see your imagination be exceeded by thousandfolds because people use it very differently. We never planned 
that you would have mountain bike races on our roof so all the grass falls off or we have these, uh, uh, this is um, uh, theater, people that are doing something for, for theater, or, or things happening here. So, so in a way, I, it's, it's really interesting to see that your buildings will be used differently than you could imagine. It also talks about a certain openness you have to have in the way you program spaces, otherwise it won't happen. And now this destination also became the place if you want to go sledding. And this is the winter day, this is from early this year. Uh, full of kids, kindergartens goes there, uh, and a lot of them haven't been to the museum, but one day they will go to the museum and they will connect that museum with the idea that this is the place where I had so much fun, and we see that will happen, maybe it's a longer perspective. In the beginning the museum people, they were really annoyed about it, now they seem to be liking it uh, as such. The last project I'll show you, that is the the project we received the Miss for the Rural Prize for in 2013, which is the Harbour uh, Concert Hall and Conference Centre in Iceland. And that project, I show this picture because that project really had a tough birth. Um, it was, we won that competition in, in 2006. Uh, it was a PPP project. We were together with a bank, a local contractor. Um, and the financial meltdown of Iceland happened two years later. We had done all the detailing. We moved people to Iceland. We started constructing. Three weeks after we moved our team to Iceland, the contractor went bankrupt. Then the bank went bankrupt, and then the government went bankrupt. So it was a pretty depressing situation. Then there were some people in the government that took a very let's say brave but also courageous decision to say that either we throw this project away and leave it as a, as a, as a ruin, a modern ruin of our despair because our economy broke down, or we build it because we want to show that we can, as a country, come through this crisis. And it, they took that decision to do that. So we, it, it was a much longer construction process. We had a lot of savings in the project, which I think really was good for the project. And we had to implement a lot of local stuff we could buy on the island because somebody had like sheets of iron, stuff like that, metal pieces, because otherwise it wouldn't happen. The, the most distinct part, of course, is the, the facade part uh, as such. This is the project where we work with Studio Olafur Eliasson and, and Olafur uh, from, from Berlin, and he was a major part of winning this competition. We, um, we knew we had a tough uh, competitor uh, crowd. We had uh, Norman Foster uh, as one of them, so we had to do something particular. And we know Olafur, we knew him from the Royal Opera in Copenhagen. He did the chandeliers, and, and the architectural understanding and way he thinks would be, would be good here. Another thing is that he's half Icelandic, or I don't know, in Germany, I think they think he's German. In Denmark, they think he's Danish. And in Iceland, they think he's Icelandic. So he, he, he gets around, but, but he's good at it. And he says an, he's a national hero in Iceland, which is, which is quite good. Uh, but he also, he also did a lot of, of really interesting work on this one. It's placed in the old industrial harbor. We have the city center uh, up here. This is the, the city hall, Studio Grande, if you know them the ones that used to be here in, maybe in Berlin. Um, they, have a, they have now in, 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 in Reykjavik. They educated at least in Germany. They did the, the city hall here, and it, it's out here. It was a very ambitious plan uh, to do uh, at the whole harbor. It didn't really happen uh, at the moment. There's a lot of students here, or at least 15% of, uh, of the people there are students. It's a, it's a young country in a, in a way. Uh, but they have this extreme climate. This is much worse or much more crazy than Umeå in, in, in Sweden, I must say that. Um, and then if you look at the size of the country, it's just above 300,000 people in total, which is a provincial city in Denmark in, in total. City of, of Reykjavik, the iconic church on top of the hill. This is the harbor project here. You see, the, just out on the horizon, you have the, uh, the mountains. 
we envy that a lot unless we do that in, with the Norwegians. In Denmark it's totally flat, so there's nothing to look at. They will never see a, a contour like that happening outside. We have four venues. We have a small venue here, which is uh, uh, with a slanted roof or, or floor, uh, build-up floor. We have flat floors in these two, and then we have, of course, a very um, build-up concert hall uh, or conference center uh, as the biggest one with 1,850 seats. The, f the reason why it's it's con it's it's composed like this is that you cannot have enough uh, things happening. In, in a city or in a country of that size if you don't do a multi-purpose uh, project. The, uh, the project in, 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 in Nigeria is also a multi-purpose, which means you have car exhibition, you have computer festival, you have uh, exams for students, you have concerts, you have rock concerts, you have acoustic concerts, and it means you have to, in a way, compromise the acoustics a little bit. You have to compromise corners to get that to work. But in, in another hand, you get a place that's fully alive 24 hours uh, a day, or at least 18 hours a day, all days of, of the week. The smaller halls placed on the ground floor, you enter here to, to the area. We have a shop. We have a small restaurant in the area here. And this is the concourse level. You come up one level of, of these stairs. And, and that's where you have the, uh, the big thing happening. Just a picture from the, from the inside. This is the smallest one. This is the biggest one. It's, it's made with, with wooden panels um, and a very simple technique. We don't have any automation. As in the opera in Copenhagen, we have the most advanced system in the world. We have hydraulics that can move all acoustic panels in all directions, which means that we can, we can make the Philharmonic of Berlin if we want that. In, to have that situation or another concert hall. In this one, you go by hand and move it, and you can only do from rock concert or rock music to acoustic music or classical music in a way. And the other smaller ones, uh, it's even more uh, primitive, but, but it, 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 it works. We set the atmosphere with a different kind of light, uh, and we have used uh, wooden uh, panels we have, we have twisted and behind we have curtains and we can move the curtains a bit and that changes the acoustics as such. But it's in here where Björk have had, this one had the concert uh, the last time. Then with, with Olofo we worked with the, with the shell or with the, uh, with the facade and, and, and the roof, but mostly with the facade. Just talks about the size of, of venue, the concourse level with the balconies uh, opening up and the, and the plaza on the outside. This is one of these uh, illustrations that's made from Studio uh, Ulf Eliasson in, in Berlin. And the interesting part is that when you look at the statistics, it says that there's four hours of, of, of darkness. But in reality, in the summer, there's no darkness at all. It's 24 hours of daylight. This, oh, sorry. This represents two hours, two hours, two hours, two hours. You see the sun comes up, goes down comes up again. So you see families with kids 3 o'clock in the morning in the main street shopping in the summertime. In the wintertime you can have, as I've been there where there was one and a half hour of daylight and you really felt like, but the day didn't really happen, just you looked out the window, you talked to somebody and it was dark again. It's like, fuck, what place is this? That is an extreme climate, that is extreme in like also Africa is kind of extreme, but this is really extreme. And we had the situation where we wanted to dis we, we wanted to design a building that that would let's say take qualities from this extreme climate. And with Olafur, that was what we were we were hunting uh, down in, in, in all the discussions and all the the, the workshops. Olafur also came <coughs> with this rock formation, which is called basalt, which is a stone. From, uh, from Iceland, very, this thing is very black. It's, um, it feels almost soft, like it's, it's an oily stone, it's not, but, but the, it's a, it feels like a soft stone. That formation of stones was, became a transformation into a facade system, and these bricks, I think we have 1,600 of them, uh, became the, the facade here. So Olafur 
and us, we work together because it's also highly technical to do this. This is a self-supporting facade, which means that we take the whole wind pressure and all that without any supporting structure. It's uh, 65 centimeters deep, 2 meters and 70 high, and it's, it's made from, uh, with glass and uh, aluminum, uh, casted aluminum uh, in the form of an iron. That is a, a first uh, a drafted uh, model made in the uh, in the Eliasson studio in, in, in Berlin, and, and that was maybe too colorful with with um, with film on, on on the glass, with mirrors, with uh, with clear glass uh, together. But that was a testing uh, time. Then we had the project uh, under construction. Um, we had the IMF loans helping us, so when they received the new IMF loan, the construction started up, and then when the money died out, the construction went down, and then they just left the place. There was nobody working there, so we had to wait. So it took a long time to build it. But the facade was bought or ordered and bought in, in, uh, in China, which was the most affordable place to, to buy it. They delivered and uh, we had tested everything. We had one guy out there every third week to test all details they did. The only detail we didn't test was the, the uh, let's say, the liquid metal they put in to, to cast it from, and that was not the right one. So, there were, so all the corners cracked of all of it. We had to take the whole, f or one of the, we did the first facade, we had to take the whole thing down, and it's still out there in front of the building. There's a big formation of the facade lying in a, in a hole, very strange. But from the inside, we create this atmosphere of a building that sucks in daylight maximum at summertime. It becomes like an indoor-outdoor situation. And it, it also takes its, its rationale in the situation where it's rather cold in summertime. Now it's set up to 40 degrees. I, I can't remember any days above seven degrees in the summertime in Iceland in the summertime. So it means that, that, that things that normally would happen here in Frankfurt outside, like the river, when you're out here in these nice evenings, it happens inside. So this space is used for, for, for gatherings, for birthdays, for things that normally would take place in an urban square. From the outside, this facade reflects and, and sucks in the atmosphere of the sky. It becomes like a, that goes in this kind of a, let's say, connection. It becomes a one thing in, in, in a way. And, uh, and from a distance, you, you see the mirroring of the sky in different angles because of the, uh, of the bricks. And from f even for further distance, you, you, you get to see the patterns where we have the, um, the, the film which is colored or mirroring film that I put in that gives this, uh, this effect. Inside, <clears throat> inside everything is, is, is dominated by the facade. All this sh the, the, the shadows, the, the way it, it works on the floor, on the stairs, uh, is so much uh, the atmosphere of that building that you can't, you can't get away from it. It's just, it's just everywhere. We wanted to open up to the street and invite people in, and that's why we created a more normal facade, a more straightforward facade to, 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 to the opening street. That's where we today have a small, uh, that was in the beginning here, but we have a restaurant in this area now. But the idea that something is happening outside should happen inside, that this thin layer of glass is only a practical thing. In reality, it's the square that comes in and, and opens up to the staircase that takes you to the concourse level uh, up here. And then, uh, on the inside again, you get this, uh, this atmosphere. You see these, see you can see it on the, yeah, you can see it here. These metal pieces, this is something we bought from a local blacksmith that couldn't sell them to anything else. Um, we had some very advanced uh, panels coming from UK, but nobody could pay for them, so they didn't arrive. Uh, so we changed into that, and, 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 and the strange thing here is, I think it added value, it added, a dimension to this building that we had to do such a rough saving uh, in a lot of the, the things. You know, we had we had an advanced Alcubon system. You know, these uh, these uh, two thin layers of, of, of aluminium and this honeycomb thing in, in between. 
we couldn't afford that. But there was a guy that had access to a copy of a Chinese version uh, in plastic. Uh, and that's the one we ended up using. And we had to cut it ourselves uh, with knives together with a carpenter. And we, we did this uh, three-dimensional thing uh, with, a, with, a hollow, with hollow ceilings because we have the light. Uh, system uh, up here and the acoustics behind. So, so in a way, a lot of things happened in the process that changed or, or improved the, the, the project. And in this instance, I think it improved the project. It, we, we, we cut the fat off in a way. We cut the, the unnecessary parts away in a, in, a good, in a good manner. And here it's just, I think it, it is a birthday party happening in the corner uh, that day. This is a picture taken in July at 10 o'clock at evening. It just talks about how the sun really just stays up. Um, and uh, the evening where the Mies van der Rook Commission, or the day where they arrived in Iceland to see the building, we, have, we had our, uh, our, our guy up there, and he called and said, it's, it's a disaster. We will never, we'll never win that prize. We knew we win the five finalists for it. And, uh, and he was like, but it's, it's, it's overcasted and it just looks like a normal building. You can't really see anything uh, because yeah, just gray. And then he called 11 o'clock at night and it was dark in Copenhagen. He said, it's fantastic. The sun is up. Everything is lit. They, they love it. I think they love it. I think it loved it. I have, to, I have to put down the phone because I have to go with group. And it was like, yeah, and then remember this. Oh, yeah, of course. It's because we are in Iceland. It's not, it's not Denmark. So, daylight is the main factor of, of, of this building. Daylight is really what, what makes this, this place uh, come to life. And, and with Ulofu and, 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 and a very good uh, uh, artistic approach to, to the facade and insisting on keeping it, we, we managed to, uh, to provide it. And it's, it is so strong there that this, this is just an, a late afternoon and the facade becomes golden. I showed this in Saudi Arabia and everybody thought it was gold. But uh, I had to disappoint them. It's only the sun making it. But, but again, the, the, the change that happens over the day, over the year, with this building is quite of, uh, kind of amazing. And again, you look, this is a yoga festival. This is from the Björk, Björk concert, and the kids using the, the other parts of the facade to sit in. Um, last week, uh, I was not there, there was another uh, guy from the office, and he came back and said, it was fantastic, they had a, a chess festival. So there was chess players all over the, the place. You know, there's a big tradition in Iceland, because uh, uh, Bob Fischer and the other guy, Kasparov, they played against each other in Reykjavik in, in, during the Cold War. There's a history to that. That's why they had this, this union of, 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 of chess. So uh, the win in the winter time, this is my last picture, in the winter time, this building uh, uh, reverses, becomes a, a beacon that lights up this very dark Reykjavik uh, almost 24 hours uh, a day um, from, from the inside out. So it, it, it changes its, its, its behavior and its, its, uh, its atmosphere. Uh, as, as the season changes. This building was last year visited by 1.3 million people, and it's a bit strange when you only have 320,000 people living on the island. So either they go there quite often, or they have a lot of tourists. I don't know, but it's, 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 it's quite amazing. So um, thank you so much. That was my first. Slightly, but also very clearly, I've uh, heard before, uh, sustainability or questions, aspects of sustainability is quite important to the, to the office. And you said at one point early on in the lecture that um, 
I mean, you, you said something that, to me, I understood it like you don't see that as any, any form of restriction or any form of, of limitation. On, on basically how you approach projects and, and design problems. You also had this quite fascinating um, aspect of strategic, um, was it planning? Con concept. Concept, strategic concept. Was to, to, to keep it out of architectural concept, yeah. so they're not the same. But how does that really, how does that really work? How, could you say, could you tell us a little bit more if do you, because that's also certainly what I have often heard, or perhaps I have unjustly thought, that questions of or demands of, in terms of sustainability is a pretty serious challenge for architecture. It is, but at the same time, it's, it's fueling it's fueling the design process now, and I think that that when when it came back into the let's say the the pragmatic part of of, of architecture that you had to be in work with sustainability. We also got a position again from being decorators to be serious uh, culture or, or society builders. And, and it, it gave us a much stronger position than we had, let's say, 15 years ago in, in, uh, in, in, in let's say, among non-architects, at least. I think in the 80s and, and in, in the 90s, we were seen as being a little bit far off and, and if you wanted to build something, you'd rather call somebody who's not too artistic in their approach. And today, you can, I wouldn't say hide, but you can justify a lot of your choices artistically with sustainability. That's a very good tool to, to talk about. You, you say like, but we need this kind of opening and the way the facade is made because it provides so much daylight. And if you don't have that, you can do it in different ways, but you cannot get the same atmosphere, something like that. So it is, it, is a, it, is a, it is a good thing. Talking about, if I should talk a little bit more about the work method, because it's, 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 it's not a rocket science. Of course it's not rocket science, because then you could not use it for 300 people. But what it does is that it creates, let's say, a, a, a common understanding of the, what the project should do. And uh, what typically happens is that I sit in these discussions to decide what is the project about. And we take a decision here, because if you take a brief, for instance, for the, for the School of, of Finance and Management here in, in Frankfurt, and we took all the pages, put them on the floor, all the 450 pages in German, which is difficult to read, then you will see that it's totally counterproductive. It cannot happen, because one page says something which is totally in opposition to what happened 10 pages further down the line. And nobody dares to take this confrontation in the institution and say, but guys, you, you have only 1,936 euros. You, you, you cannot have, you know, it, it, it will not happen. So we rather say either we put more money in or we say we, we, we're looking for more modest or we, we concentrate about the spaces and we cannot have these qualities. So what happens in the strategic concept is that we take that decision because otherwise we cannot do the competition. Because we, we, we have caught between these different ambitions. Before we had that work method, we, we sketched our way through that. And we were so dependent on who was sketching every time. And, and when you grow bigger, you're not the same people sketching. I have nine teams, nine teams sketching projects all the time. And, and so that's the discussion among the nine teams. It's like, what is the strategic concept for this project? What are we going for? What is the aims? And, and we are never discussing form, maybe it's a little bit of diagram, but never form in these discussions. It's forbidden. You cannot have any sketches about form because otherwise you already decide how the building should look. It's, it's more, or the, 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 the city plan should be. It's much more interesting to talk about the whys in the beginning and then flesh it out differently. It also allows the, let's say, the very young people in the team, students, for instance, in the competition teams, to, to, to come with like, an idea to bring it on the table, because it's, it's a much more safe ground to do that on. If, if, if the master's sitting there <laughs> with a pen, no, I don't even mean a pen, <laughs> sitting there with a pen, with his own thoughts, and everybody sit waiting, and oh, what can it be, what can it be? You cannot participate. You cannot bring something to the table. This is the chance to do that. And this is something, this goes all the way back to the old 
Professor Larsen. When I started in that office in, in 89, I, I was, uh, I hit on it, it was maybe a bit strong word for that, but at least interviewed, we were two interviewed from the School of Architects in Aarhus. We came there and I, I was selected, I don't know why, but at least I sat there. And for the first three months, he didn't say a word to me. And I was sketching for a big project in, 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 in Cambridge, in England, and he didn't say anything. And in the end, I was like totally dried out. I didn't know what to do. And then what did he do? He just looked like, hmm, looks interesting. What are you doing? Oh, I'm doing this project in the UK. And I was like, oh, let's look at that and tell me about what's your ideas. And in a way, this is so different from his peers at the same age. They all had this idea that they sketched and the, the young guy had to react to that. In our office, it was op the opposite. The young guy sketched and he reacted to that, which I think is, 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 a, is a way. It's also why this method, in a, in a way, came out as a natural part of, of developing uh, our, our world production. Then at one point you then arrived that you said that you developed then two alternative architectural solutions and then you evaluate those. And at this point things have been sketched I suppose. Then you sketch. As soon as you have the, uh, the strategic concept you sketch. Then you form typically two groups in the team to go in a direction. And then you, you look at it. And what's interesting is that if you, if you allow that to, to be developed to a certain level, you will see that the ones, the one concept being chosen benefits so much from having the other one just behind it. Because there's so much learning in the other sketch. There's so much things, so many things you could do and test and do differently that comes from the concept not chosen to, to, to work on. So the, it is a it is a quite a fruitful process, even though you have to be, you know, sometimes People cry a little bit when their concept is not chosen for further development. Yeah. Any questions? Anyone? Luis, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.